Thanks, Councilman Cook to lead us in prayer and Councilman Lewis to lead us in the pledge. I'm sorry, Sister Cook. We meet to, to serve our community, to use our resources wisely and well, to represent all members of our community fairly, to make decisions that promote the common good. We recognize our responsibility to the past and the future and the rights and needs of both individuals and the community. As trusted servants, we seek blessings on our deliberations and on our efforts here today. May we act wisely and well. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you, members, for that service. We welcome you to the Lafayette City Parish Council meeting. We, as your representatives in the Lafayette Consolidated Government, welcome your involvement and encourage your participation. This meeting is a public hearing. If you wish to address the council on any item on this agenda, please fill out a blue request to address the council form, noting the agenda item number. The blue form is available to you in the far and should be submitted to the council clerk, Ms. Veronica L. Williams, seated to my left in the middle prior to the call of the agenda item. It is important to fill out the blue form completely and note the specific agenda item number about which you wish to speak. If the card is not completely filled out or is not legible to the clerk, you will not be given the opportunity to speak. If you have materials you wish to submit to the council, please give those to Ms. Williams along with your blue form. In an effort to allow everyone an opportunity to be heard, the five-minute rule will be in effect. Speakers shall refrain from debating, personal attacks, and from making confrontation or derogatory comments. I'm requesting that the first rule to my left be used for media only. Lastly, food and drinks are not allowed in the auditorium, and all phones and electronic devices shall be silenced from this point forward. I am also requesting that anyone who approaches the council state their name and title for the official record. Meeting procedures are by resolution and not by Robert's rule of order. Documents including agendas, ordinances, resolutions, and minutes related to this meeting are posted online <coughs> at www.lafayettela.gov or refer to the web address on the top of the agenda. The council encourages your involvement and participation by volunteering for boards and commissions. If you are interested in finding out which board suits your interest, please call 291 8800 or pick up a pamphlet at the door. I do have a few chair announcements. First, item number 17, members, this one is for you and our public. Item 17, that's ordinance number 079 2017. This is relative to street lighting agreement with the city of Youngsville, has a proposed amended amendment and it's being requested by legal to make formatting corrections and replace the words electric franchise agreement with street lighting agreement in section two of the ordinance. Also item number 25, again item number 25, ordinance number 091-2017 relative to the alcohol code has a proposed amendment requested by legal to remove an extraneous R from the whereas clause to amend section 6-14C one and C2 to add language except during the days and times of Monday through Sunday, 12 a.m. until 6 a.m. to amend section 6-14C3 with reference to the posting of notices on plastic cups and to amend section 6-39C to modify the word retail with class B. That's a lot of activity. Um, we're meeting our obligation by announcing it in advance. Once we get to that particular item, we'll talk about it in detail. Also, item number 14, item 14, ordinance 076 2017 on the Foreman Drive rezoning, I'm sorry, Foreman Drive zoning matter. An amendment will be offered. That amendment will come from the floor from the member representing that district. Okay? I would like to wish Kyle Manso, Lafayette Police Department Security for the council meetings, a happy birthday, which he celebrates on May the 28th. Kyle, happy wow. birthday, man. Mm. Kyle does an unbelievable.
unbelievable job meeting people and, and just assuring the safety at our meetings and uh, couldn't ask for a better person. Thank you for all you do, Kyle. Also, Jared Bellard, District 5 Council Member, is unable to make tonight's meeting due to a work commitment. He will not be with us on tonight. And my final announcement is I would like to announce that there will be a first responder Sunday at Louisiana Avenue United Methodist Church. That's first responder Sunday uh, for all uh, law enforcement, inclusive of the municipalities, state police, and other, as well as, of course, Lafayette PD, all firefighters and military personnel. That's at 2700 Louisiana Avenue beginning at 9 a.m. That's on May the 28th. 2017, a service in honor of first responders. Okay. Ms. Cook, do you have an announcement? Yes. Yes, I just wanted to give the Lafayette Parks and Recreation a little shout out. It's uh, that time of the year and kids will be out for the summer. And so I wanted to kind of give you some information about the camps that are coming up. Uh, registration will begin next week for the camps that they do have. And the camps run June 12th through July 28th. Um, 9 a.m. to 4, they do offer extended hours, and the cost is $150 a week, which is extremely, excuse me, for the summer, what am I saying? For the summer, the whole program. So it's an excellent, uh, excellently priced program. Um, there are about six parks and centers that they have these programs for the summer. Um, and if you need some information, you can go to Lafayette Consolidated Government website under Summer Enrichment Program, and you can get all the details as far as that information goes. But the camps will begin July, excuse me, June 12th, but registration begins next week on the 25th of May. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that information. Any other council announcements? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to now go to the executive president's report. Welcome, Mr. Robidoux. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a couple of um, uh, proclamations that I'd like to read uh, first. Uh, the first one is uh, regarding uh, the bike month. Whereas for more than a century, the bicycle has been a, an important part of the lives of most Americans, and whereas an ever-increasing number of Lafayette City Parish residents engage in cycling as an environmentally sound form of transportation, family-friendly recreation, and an excellent form of fitness, and whereas a safe cycling environment is a community asset, provides a key quality of life amenity that attracts new residents and businesses and draws tourism spending, and whereas in the Lafayette Comprehensive plan vision statement. Residents express their desire for bicycle friendly streets in a healthful community that prioritizes investments in quality recreation opportunities. And whereas bicyclists and cycling advocacy groups throughout Lafayette Parish promote the benefits of cycling and work to increase public awareness of the rules, laws, and practices that reduce bicycle related accidents, injuries, and fatalities. And whereas the education of both bicyclists and motorists regarding the proper and safe operation of both vehicles is important to ensure the safety and comfort of all road users. Now, therefore, I, Joe Robito, Mayor, President of Lafayette Consolidated Government, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2017 as Bike Month. I think Sidra's. Yes, I'm here representing um, the partners who are putting on the Bike Safety Festival that's happening this Saturday. That's May the 20th. It's going to be at Park San Suci from 9 a.m. until noon. It's a totally free festival, and we invite bicyclists of all levels and all ages to come down. The, uh, the, the festival is being hosted in partnership with Lafayette Consolidated Government, Bike Lafayette, and Bruce Arden Davi Law Firm. We'll be giving out up to 300 certified helmets for both youth and adults. We've also got other giveaways as long as supplies last, including uh, bike lights and t-shirts. There's going to be, of course, it's not a festival without music and food, so there'll be complimentary food and there'll be music as well. Uh, we're going to be also offering uh, free bicycle registration through the Lafayette P Police Department. When um, in the ev event of a lost or stolen bicycle, registering with the Lafayette Police Department um, ensures that it gets back to the, its proper owner um, when it's found. There will be also safety instruction classes and a giveaway of a $300 uh, bicycle from Bike Lafayette. So 
We invite everybody to come out and participate. There's going to be a little kids obstacle course, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Also, the Ride for Rocks is going to be kicking off from the Bike Safety Festival at Park San Susi. There's two levels. One's a long ride, and then the secondary ride is a, a family ride, and it's for um, anybody of all ages, and it's a fully escorted ride, and it's free. They just ask that you register um, in advance for that, and you can go to trail to register. And then lastly, there is a bicycle lane cleanup immediately following the festival from noon until 3 p.m., and that's hosted by uh, Forward Lafayette. So uh, anybody that wants to help spruce up the bicycle lanes are also invited to do that. So lots of opportunities going on around bicycle safety, bicycle awareness, and um, recreation. So thank you. Hold on, Sidra. I think Mr. Conk may have something. Oh. Having a slight interest in cycling. Yes. Just wanted to remind everyone that uh, this Friday is actually Ride Your Bike to Work Day. Yes. So I'm inviting the council to join me. Good day. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up because we'll actually be doing a no-pay bus day on Friday. The release will go out after um, the council meeting tonight in conjunction with the proclamation. And it's a great opportunity for cyclists to both ride and bus. It could be uh, there's no additional fee for, for bikes. And on this day, it's free for everyone. Um, so if you, if you live far from a bike path uh, or, or uh, live far from a, a bus stop, you can ride your bike to the bus stop. Uh, bus to the to work and and walk the way. So multimodal transportation opportunities. Um, Sidra, yes, on, on that note, and Bruce bring up a good point, but I heard somebody say they don't have a bike. Um, <laughs> we 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 could work on that. I recently saw a program through the National League of Cities, and and as it relates to um, transportation for individuals who do have jobs, but possibly. Um, not yet able to afford a vehicle or do not take advantage of transit services of the of the particular government. Um, and I'm going to ask for your assistance on this. I'm going to forward it to you. Um, there is actually a bike loaner program that exists. And um, Bruce, maybe that's something also you could assist with. Um, and it may be something that could really resonate here in the Lafayette community uh, where people could actually, that there are a pool of bikes that are available. And I know even in, without law enforcement, sometimes we, we, um, we, we come into possession of bikes that people don't claim. And um, there may be something there. So just in the spirit of, of, of bike safety, my, my issue is a little bit more severe. I have a bike. I don't have a job. But it's a, it's a, but, um, yeah, but 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 um, in in the in the spirit of just uh, cycling and, and, and riding, um, I think it would be something with with some of the progressive areas of Lafayette that we've identified might be something that we want to look into. But Certainly. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Robido, you just have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one more proclamation. Whereas mental health is critical for our well-being as well as that of our communities and businesses. And whereas since 1990, mental health advocates across the country have joined together during the month of May to celebrate Mental Health Month, and whereas in recognition of efforts to raise awareness of mental illness, Mental Health Month is held each year in May to encourage further understanding and to promote early intervention and treatment for mental illness. And whereas the World Health Organization found that mental illnesses rank first in disability in the United States, and collectively are the most prevalent health problems in America today, more common than cancer and lung and heart disease combined. And whereas mental disorders such as schizophrenia, depression, and anxiety disorders are real, common, and treatable illnesses, and whereas real recovery from mental illness requires community action, understanding, and teamwork, recovery is possible because of improved science, better community support, and reduced stigma, but significant barriers still remain. Services are at risk and there is a minimal and there is minimal insurance available for those who work. Now therefore I, Joel Robito, Mayor President of Lafayette Consolidated Government, do hereby proclaim May 2017 as Mental Health Awareness Month in the city and parish of Lafayette and call upon all citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools to recommit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of mental illness and the need for appropriate and accessible services for all people with mental illness. And I think Holly's here. Holly, if you want to come up and say a few words. 
Good evening. I'm Dr. Holly Howitt. I'm the Executive Director of the Lafayette Parish Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee, or CJCC, of which our Mayor President Robodeau is the current chair of. Um, in 2015, the CJCC recognized uh, mental illness was a big problem in um, our parish, but particularly in our criminal justice system, about 30% of inmates in the jail right now have a serious mental illness, and it costs taxpayers a lot of money, um, not to mention that these people do not get the treatments that they need. So um, we've been working together with law enforcement agencies across the parish, public mental health um, agencies and community um, agencies and patient consumer advocacy groups to work on this problem. And I just want to highlight real quickly three projects that um, we've already gotten underway um, that have gotten national recognition. Um, one is our crisis intervention training for law enforcement officers. This teaches officers how to respond and de-escalate situations um, in, with an individual that's in mental health crisis. We had our first training in March and we already have two more training scheduled for this year. Um, law enforcement officers are very happy with this and I think it's going to really help. Um, the second thing is um, a group partnership with agencies um, such as 232 Help, um, St. Bernadette's Clinic and Acadiana Cares have come together to create the Crisis Connections Center, which basically um, allows officers of the public to um, refer people that are in mental health crisis so they don't end up in jail or the ER. Um, in the first quarter, it looked like um, we um, had 63 face-to-face -face counseling sessions with about 28 individuals and were able to refer them into more appropriate long-term treatments. It was very successful. The last thing I want to talk about is what we call our Familiar Faces Staffing, which we started three months ago, and it brings... Um, law enforcement agencies and public mental health agencies and other places like the jail together to look at what are the, what are the treatment plans for high need, often homeless individuals. Um, we have our top 10 list. It was primarily homeless people downtown that were um, what is called treatment resistant. They didn't really want the help that was offered. And so to date, out of the 14 people that have been identified, about 30% of them are into long-term care and it's been very successful. I want to come up and take a picture. Keith, you want to come be a part of this? Just stay down for a second. Chief, Chief, if you could stay up front for a second with Mr. Robido and Ter I see Terry is here. Terry Uvo, if you could come forward. Did I miss any other directors? Carly, I'm sorry, Carly, if you could come forward, please. And Veronica, would you go down and represent the council, please, as the clerk? Mr. Terrio. Yes, um, uh, one thing we need to do, Mr. Carroll, if you don't mind, could you come up here? I have a quick question for you. <laughs> Mr. Carroll, is it, uh, from my understanding, I'm going to try and define the de definition of brevity here, but um, uh, it's our understanding that you're going to be leaving us at the end of the month. So I wasn't going to let you sneak away in without being acknowledged. So, um, uh, Myself, I want to thank you for you, your experience, your knowledge, and your years of service. You've been very kind. I know at least to me, I'm not speaking for other council members, but you've always, you've always returned calls and, and answered emails. So by all means, Mr. Carroll, we will miss you and, and thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for those kind words. Yeah. How yeah. long have you been with us, Mr. Carroll? Uh, recently about 16 months, but before that, that, about 22 years. Okay. Well, Mr. Carroll, thank you again, sir. I do appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and, and Tom, and, and any council member who wants to chime in, certainly just make, make, make your name aware, but um, 
we certainly, I, I think I told you less than an hour ago to reconsider. <laughs> but uh, you, you, you've, you've been a very, very valuable component of this government. Um, arguably, arguably one of the most challenging departments to head with all of the issues, um, every, everything that's significant to government, roads and bridges and drainage and all these things. And I tell you, um, in my 10 plus years here, you've always stood in this room at that mic as a champion of what is right. And, and I just can't thank you enough for just the leadership that you've shown uh, to this department. We always say that everyone's replaceable, and I think that's, that's accurate, but I, I know that it's gonna be challenging uh, for the president. I had asked those who were here, some of your colleagues, to just stay down. And of course, we're gonna ask Mr. Robidoux to comment once he go back to his chair, but I just ask uh, for ceremonial purpose that they stay down. I know these are people you work with weekly and you know, have to communicate with often and the leadership of this government. So certainly um, in the church, we, we offer the right hand of God. So if y'all could definitely at least shake his hand. Do something. <laughs> But take a picture, something. But uh, we just went in time. We want to hear from you as well if you have something to say. <laughs> Chief, I asked for all direct. You just came in. You, you made... <laughs> oh, <laughs> he was already up here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Lord. Stick Harley in the front. Director of IT. I asked for all directors. What are we doing? I didn't rec just recognize him. Tom was his last meeting. I just want to thank everyone involved, you know, thank God. Uh, and it's a team effort, you know, I'm just part of the team and I've always looked at it like that and we have a very talented group in public works and throughout the LCG. So uh, it'll continue, it'll run. Uh, so um, be offer my assistance in any way I can. After I leave, I'll be home and I'll change Last myself. Last time you said I'll change that, my called you back. Number, though. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, I'm not going to answer any calls from Joel, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I appreciate that it, administration has been just absolutely wonderful working with these guys and this entire council, legal staff, and, you know, everybody out here. So it, it's, it's been a good ride. Joel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me just say, Tom says it's a team effort, and he's just part of the team, but it's kind of like Tom Brady getting up there saying it's just a team effort, you know. <laughs> um, Tom, you did me a huge favor. As, as everyone, I think, here knows that um, during the transition, um, as I'm trying to, to put together a team, um, I snuck you off to a room and begged you to <laughs> reconsider retirement, although this morning he said he's not retiring, he's quitting this time. Last time he <laughs> retired, and that didn't work out well. So um, I, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your willingness to come and bail me out of the jam that I found myself in and trying to to hire someone in, in a, a few short weeks for what is the meat and potatoes of a government, the, the Public Works Department. And so thank you for staying longer than what we had originally agreed to. Uh, I appreciate everything that you've done. I appreciate the fact that you are willing to come and help us uh, through this next transition. And um, everyone is replaceable. You're going to be incredibly difficult to replace. Uh, but I, I'm at least comfortable and knowing that you are in Lafayette, and I will make sure to have one of the councilmen call you and not call you myself to make sure you answer the phone um, out of obligation. Thanks for everything, and uh, I appreciate it. Appreciate that to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, I think you had one other item um, that I had requested we address here because of some changes that's coming about. So you take the floor again, please. Yes, if I could, um, Sidra, are you prepared uh, to take off your photography hat and put on your communications director hat? And uh, we're, 
Sidra's going to brief us all on the on the situation with the the garbage and waste collection um, that I, I think was publicized in this morning's paper. So, Sidra, if you could give us a summary of of what that is. Yes. So as everyone um, at the council is aware, there is going to be some changes coming down the pike with regard to waste collection services for delinquent citizens in the unincorporated areas. Um, I, again, I want to stress that these citizens that are potentially facing interruption of trash collection are delinquent and they're only in the unincorporated areas of the parish. Um, these citizens who are delinquent have received at minimum four notices from Republic Services um, and they are now what is considered probably a closed account and some of them could have been receiving continued trash collection um, for quite some time beyond uh, that 90 days, 120 days, um, even though they haven't been paying. Uh, so Republic has come to the conclusion that they need to go ahead and um, make those, those stop collecting the trash for those people. And um, this comes as a matter because it is a mandatory, it's a local ordinance that uh, residents in the unincorporated areas of the parish sign up and pay for trash collection service as a uh, issue of public health. Um, it is also, I want to point out, a revenue uh, component for people in the unincorporated areas, not just in the unincorporated areas, but with the with the, um, the trash collection contract, LCG receives um, a little over 350 a month for uh, each bill um, that is goes towards a, a waste assessment fee. And um, if we take together all of the people in the unincorporated areas that are potentially facing um, this, this uh, interruption of garbage service, um, it's quite a significant sum of money that should be uh, owed to, to LCG as well. So it's a it's a budgetary issue beyond just a public safety um, issue. It is about 4,000 people, um, and LC, uh, Republic will be rolling out this interruption of service uh, beginning tomorrow with the Wednesday customers. Um, the unincorporated customers are only serviced on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, so we're looking at those three collection days. Um, for people to get current, it's relatively easy. Um, they just need to go to republicservices.com or they can call the number um, to get themselves back up to speed. I want to point out that um, Republic is being pretty fair uh, with what people need to do to get current. Um, they only will be required to pay a quarter of back service, regardless of how long they haven't been current with their bill um, and have still been receiving that service. So it's going to be approximately $75 uh, per account for people to get current with Republic Services, and then they can get right back on. It's possible that some people may have, t you know, sort of um, a, moved into the situation. There was a can there. They didn't know they needed to get service, and so it's possible <laughs> that people might find themselves in this situation. If you find yourself, uh, put your can out on your day, and you don't get service, you need to call Republic Services um, and find out what the situation is. You can report it. It's possible that it could just be a missed pickup, but there could be an issue with your account that possibly you're even not even aware of. Um, and so those are the issues that we're kind of facing, and um, we will be handling it as um, we're trying to communicate it as broadly as we can so people know what the issue is, know why it's an issue, know how they can resolve the issue, and they make sure that they're not finding themselves in a, um, a situation where they're unable to um, take care of their solid waste. Is Terry? Yes, quick question I have. How long do they have to be in arrears before their trash can will actually be picked up, or is that even done? Right now, Republic is not picking up trash cans. Um, their hope is that people will go ahead and get current, um, and they'll be begin collecting right away. So right now, Republic hasn't set a timeline or a deadline on when they will take those cans back, um, and they'll just stop collecting the cans at this time. We just want to make sure, because naturally these people who are not current are going to put their trash at the road, a full trash can. It's not going to be picked up. We want to make sure that trash doesn't end up on the side of the road, on the highway, or somewhere else. Yes, sir. That's uh, dumping and how people are going to manage their trash is something that we're definitely concerned about, um, and we will be monitoring that, and uh, as will code enforcement. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. That's all I have. Thank you. Any other? Mr. Lewis? 
Sir, you say there's roughly about 4,000 people in an unincorporated area, correct? That's the number that's being reported to us for delinquent customers. So yes, it can sir. be only, say, one person want to bring themselves up to date. The service will continue just for that one person. Correct. Um, service, if only one person decided right. that they want to go ahead and take action and get themselves current with their account, um, they would they would begin receiving service again. There is a, a list of potential um, actions that could be taken for anybody who decides to not um, become current, which includes additional fines, um, an injunction, um, all the way up to jail time, but that's a pretty extreme case. All right, thank you. Is that it, Mr. Lewis? Yes. Okay. All right. Sidra, thank you for the update. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Robidoux. Um, I know this has been an issue for quite some time. And, and again, the number was given um, for those listening. If you need services in the unincorporated area, please contact Republic Services Direct at the number that was provided. Um, if you have any questions at all, that's the best possible number to call to get all of your issues addressed. And, and hopefully these it can be resolved relatively easily. Okay? All right. That's all you have? That's all for me. Okay. Thank you. Well, now I'll move to comments from the public. Um, again, this portion of our meeting is an opportunity to make your voice heard before the council, the administration, and the public. This is the time to um, speak about topics that are not included as agenda items. As I noted earlier, your request to make comments specific to an agenda item should be made prior to the call for that agenda item by completing a blue request to address the council form for each agenda item in which you wish to address. With that agenda item number noted on the blue form. Please, we request that all matters regarding specific city parish employees be directed to the administration and that they not be addressed at this public forum. We as a council have a concern for privacy and protection of government employees. With that said, however, if your concern is not resolved in either an expeditious or satisfactory fashion, there are other avenues which you can pursue and we ask that you follow with the council office at that time. Also, confrontational statements and or threats will not be tolerated. We ask that you conduct yourself in a civil manner and with the same courtesy that you would expect of others, the five-minute rule is in effect. And I just want to repeat, because uh, sometimes it is confusing, if there's an item that is on today's agenda, somewhere down the line, whether it's the first one or the last one up, this is not the time to speak to that item. You speak to that item at the agenda time. This is only for things that will not be talked about tonight, okay? With that said, first speaker, please. The first speaker is Joseph Kazala, and he did request to speak on traffic speed, speed lumps, and speed signs. There is an item on the agenda with reference to that, but I'm not sure if his is just general comment or specifically in reference to Web Street. Is this in reference to the Web Street project, or is this something else? Okay. Okay. That's... Okay. Yes, sir. So that's, that'll be at the agenda item, okay? So that's item number okay. 22. That'll be item 20. And he signed up for that one as well? We'll put him at that one. Okay. They'll put you on that item for that time. Okay. Next speaker. Janae Gosson. Gosson? Ms. Gosson? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Either mic. You could go. Um, as you approach, either mic you would like to use is fine. You could pick that mic up for yourself, ma'am. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about there being more transparency needed in the LAUS decision making. Um, there is a hundred dollar, a uh, hundred, sorry, hundred million dollar bond for a new power plant coming up, and the current plants we have are not being used even close to their full capacity because it's cheaper for us to buy the energy from Texas. So, and the one that's being proposed that we built is, isn't even the most efficient form of power. It's not the most efficient form of uh, power plant we could be making. So there's really not much of a point to be making it. And there's, we have no, currently no uh, uh, renewable resource plan uh, with LUS, even though renewables are the cheapest to buy. Uh, we should be getting more people to work and live here. And I think having molding, moving forward with bold new strategies like committing to having more renewable energy uh, would definitely bring in more people, bring in more businesses. Uh, Georgetown, Texas was able to do it. They're 
uh, Greenberg, Kansas, they're also 100%. So this isn't just, you know, places in California or in Iceland. These are little tiny towns. This is Texas. You know, they're able to do it. We can at least say, well, we can at least have this uh, plan to move forward on that. Not even necessarily 100%, but at least have a commitment. So I, I want to say to hold off on that, the new power plant, and let's instead focus on what we can be doing about renewables as in diversifying our energy in general. That's it. Thank you. Next, next speaker, please. Next speaker, Larry Judge Glover. I'd like to go second after Ray Green, my cohort. Awesome. No, sir. When, when your name is called, you up. <laughs> Good evening. Ray Green and I are here to talk about armchairs in the public venue. He and I both, and many other of our veterans, we have uh, mobility problems. Most of them are age-related. Some are because of long distance service to the country in years past. We have armchairs, we'd like to have 5% of armchairs in all public venues, restaurants, um, public facilities, even like this. I noticed many of your chairs have arms on them. Just as an example, and not to embarrass anybody, if you put your hands up like this and try to get up without the arm, using the arms, is it possible? Can you do that without pitching forward or embarrassing yourself? We don't like to do that. Several years ago, this council passed a statement that it would be a good thing to have, but nothing's been done since then. So we're trying to get things moving along the line to get this done. Um, it's just problematical to get up, and these, these bucket seats here, so to speak, you know, you're not supposed to bend your leg over 90 degrees when you sit. Well, I find that my legs are bent something like 27 degrees when you sit in it because you sit down like this and then the knee goes up higher and all the weight goes back on the back of the legs, restricting the blood flow, and it hurts over a period of time. Every last one of you are maturing and you're going to face this problem sometime in the future. I'd like to start resolving this now. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Simon Mahan. Good evening, I'm Simon Mahan. I'm a resident of District 2 and an LUS customer, and these are my boys. This is Jonah, he's six, and this is Felix, he's two. I apologize for Felix, he is eagerly waiting some M&Ms. Um, so I came here this evening to talk a little bit about electric vehicles and um, some possibilities for Lafayette and Lafayette Parish uh, to better incorporate more transportation modes. I'm very pleased to hear about the, the bike transportation proclamation. That's a, a fantastic thing. Um, I think the next thing we need to start thinking about are some high voltage uh, electric vehicle charge stations. Uh, Lafayette, the city and, and the parish are actually the only cities in Louisiana, the main cities, um, that doesn't have a high speed electric charger for electric vehicles. Um, these are 480 volt type public charging stations that uh, electric cars can go plug in at. Uh, they are a lot quicker to charge your electric cars with, so you can charge your cars in as little as 15 minutes. Um, and they, they provide a really good opportunity for folks that are using electric vehicles to, to charge up relatively quickly. So you can put a charge station out by a business, out by a library, at the Rosa Parks Transportation Station, um, somewhere that folks are going to go for you know, 15, 30 minutes and charge up their electric cars. And we do have a number of electric cars driving around town now. Uh, Tesla, uh, the Chevy Bolt, 
uh, Nissan Leafs. These are new electric cars that are re regularly available, and you can actually go online and buy a, a relatively good used Nissan Leaf electric car for as little as $9,000. So they're rapidly coming more popular. Uh, the quicker you can charge them, the better. Um, and as I said, uh, a lot of other cities like Lake Charles and Alexandria and Slidell and even Monroe, Monroe has these high-speed electric chargers, um, but we don't have one yet, yet here in Lafayette. At least we don't have public ones that are available for folks. Um, and I have a solution for you all. So back in 2014, when Volkswagen had their diesel emissions scandal, uh, they had to set aside about $4.7 billion worth in money uh, to give out to the states. And the state air agencies, so here in Louisiana, that's the DEQ, the Department of Environmental Quality, is going to be managing a fund of about $18 million to figure out what to do with this money to improve air quality. And one of the things that you can do as a state is, in is to install more electric vehicle charge stations. Um, so we can use some of that money uh, based on population alone. Lafayette could ask for about $2 million, um, you know, one to two million dollars uh, that would readily spend, you know, uh, and buy a number of these electric vehicle charge stations. Um, some of the other things. <laughs> um, a number th of things that you can also do with the $2 million are buy electric buses. So if we have any diesel buses that are still in the fleet um, that we need to upgrade eventually, you know, the city's already spent good money um, to upgrade our, our fleet to the compressed natural gas, which was a, a fantastic thing. It helped yes. reduce air yes. emissions yes. and it helps save on maintenance and fuel costs. Um, so we can buy, yeah, one minute. <laughs> we, <laughs> actually a minute 38. Um, so we can, we can upgrade to these electric vehicle buses. Uh, they're starting to get more readily available. We don't need to do the whole fleet. And of course, with the $2 million, we're not gonna be able to do that. Um, and then one final thought is to um, install some electric plugs at, uh, at, <laughs> at, um, at gas stations where large semi-truck drivers go to spend the night. So a lot of the time they'll idle their vehicle overnight so that they can run their air conditioners or their heaters. But instead what you can do is you can install these electric plugs for them to, to plug in. It helps them save fuel. It draws more attention to the city as a place for them to stop overnight. Um, and also with the electric vehicle charge stations, for folks that are traveling between Houston and New Orleans, if they're thinking about coming to Lafayette for a tourist, uh, you know, purpose, they're not going to be using their electric cars. Um, and so it's just one more thing that we can help drive more attention to Lafayette. Um, it's relatively low cost to maintain and to install, and they eventually pay for themselves because we, uh, you know, they're, they're buying the electricity through these new charge stations. So uh, I'd strongly encourage y'all, if, if you haven't already reached out to the DEQ, ask them what they're going to be doing with the funding. Um, they are soliciting proposals from city government agencies to figure out what to do with this $18 million, and so I think you all have a little bit of a head start over everybody else. Um, so please get in touch with them and see what we can do about the electric vehicles and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Simon. There is one comment, but I got a text message from Bob Giles. He want to thank you for that Nissan commercial. Yeah. <laughs> Great car. They're, they're a lot of fun to drive, too. So. Mr. Cone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick follow-up, Mr. Mahan. Uh, about three weeks ago, Ms. Hebert and I uh, had the opportunity to ride in an electric bus. <laughs> uh, that was brought in for demo purposes here in Lafayette. And the reason for that is that we are in the planning stages to purchase possibly four electric buses. That's excellent. And hopefully that will come to fruition within the next six months. That's great. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. Next speaker. Cassandra Ford. short sorry all right um, so I am also here to talk about renewable energy and how Lafayette can try to incorporate that into our energy sources so as uh, one of my friends mentioned before you all are thinking about trying to build a 100 million dollar uh, power plant that will be coming up in the budget later this year but it's not incorporating any sort of renewable energy into that equation. And so you all use um, a model through LUS to try to calculate kind of how much energy the city and parish will be using and how many different power plants will be needed in order to cover those types of energy costs. 
But when you're using that equation, uh, you're not incorporating renewables at all into the equation because they're, quote, unreliable or too expensive. And at this point, I think we've come up with enough, te enough technology that it might be a bit of an investment at the beginning to try to incorporate renewables into our infrastructure, but the end, at the end of the day, it is the most cheapest form of energy that we have right now. And so I think it would bring Lafayette into the future if we were to try to invest more, some of that $100 million, instead of into a natural gas energy power plant, into some renewable energy, because that is the wave of the future. That's where uh, in energy infrastructure is going in our country. And it's definitely a more clean and efficient way to power our city. Uh, further, we're part of the MISO uh, power grid, and I think they already have about 14% of their energy source coming from renewables. And if we have renewable energy, even if we're not able to use it all ourselves immediately, it would go back into that MISO grid and actually help us uh, in the future as we're, like, so, if we uh, provide energy for the MISO grid, we're then able to compensate for energy uses when the sun isn't shining or when the wind isn't blowing through that power grid. And so I really hope uh, you all are already going in the right direction with this, with electric buses, and you voted to add LED light bulbs to street lamps and stuff like that. And so I hope you guys can see the future for Lafayette with renewable energies and not just rely on our old technology and instead go towards the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Thank you, Isaac. Hi, I just wanted to also um, talk a little bit about encouraging LUS to consider renewables into its mix. Um, happiest city, the best small town for business. Lafayette started to show up on some enviable lists in the past few years. Um, as a town that's in the social and cultural vanguard of the region, though, um, there's another list we should be looking at, namely Sierra Club's list of cities that are working toward 100% renewable energy in the next 20 years. That, the cities on that list range from tiny little Greenberg, Kansas, population 785, as someone mentioned, to San Diego, San Jose, and San Francisco. One unlikely city on that list, though, is Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's a good example for Lafayette to follow. Like Lafayette, Grand, Rip Grand Rapids is a mid-size regional hub. Um, like Louisiana, Michigan's seen its fortunes go up and down and up and down over the years based on the vagaries of old energy. Unlike Lafayette, though, Grand Rapids is on track to move toward 100% renewable energy use by 2020, but mainly by reducing consumption somewhat and by um, investing in and building on solar energy. Grand Rapids saw the future early on developing a comprehensive sustainability plan in 2006. They gave themselves seven years to become 30% renewable. That means we could do the same by the middle of the next decade. We've made a start by recycling, as, we, as we've talked about, and by building some bike paths, encouraging bike transportation. We just did that this evening. Um, those are both elements in Grand Rapids' sustainability plan. Rather than investing in and building a, an old energy plant that may sit idle, um, let's ask the community to work together to develop a sustainability plan. Let's transition LUS from being an old energy provider into a new energy innovator. It's time to catch up to the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Andrew Abair, and for this item, he turned in two blue cards, one as a city resident and one as a parish resident. Still get five minutes in. <laughs> Just five minutes. That's great. Because I want to invite everyone out there to watch the rest of the meeting. There you go. Because we will be presenting a demonstration of unequal treatment by this government. Uh, first of all, I'd like to know, are we consolidated? because I see this on some vehicles, but I don't see it on all of them. Why is that? It says Lafayette Consolidated Government. Should it be on the city police department's cars, the fire trucks, park police, parish courthouse? You have it here on the old city hall. So are we really consolidated? So I was gonna have a contest about that and offer some money, if y'all could name five of them 
that don't have this. So that proves we're not consolidated. So they came up with the newest logo. You got it right up there, it's perfect. The big L, the true blue. You know what the true blue stands for? The true blue stands for the sanctuary cities. Those cities that don't come under consolidated regulations or rules. They're true blue. Top, top left up there, Doucan, Scott. Blue to the right, top. Karen Crow, blue to the bottom left. Youngsville, blue to the bottom right. Broussard, red in the middle, red China, consolidated government. Taxation without equal representation. You sent me the information I asked for. And sure enough, I did it. And I got a copy for all of you. This is the breakdown of the number of registered voters by district on the parish level, on the city level, and on the unincorporated level. And when you talk about the property tax resolutions coming up, we're going to talk about this. I'm going to show you what taxation and unequal representation is about. Oh, by the way, my name is Andrew Hebert. My title is registered city voter, registered parish voter, dual voters. I put in a public information request for the tool, technique, ordinance, or whatever it is that says the Constitution requires you to absorb the city of Lafayette debts. I want to know where that is. I want to see how you did it. I also put in a public information request for the letter sent to the Registrar of Voters because I petitioned you to de-annex my property to become Lafayette Parish 1. According to the de-annexation process, you're supposed to send a letter to the Registrar of Voters to certify that I'm a registered voter of the property that I requested de-annexed. I also asked for a copy of the letter the administration sent, hopefully, to the tax assessor to get the property ownership certified that I own this property and that the assessed values of that property. So you can figure out if I'm the correct owner and I file the correct petition to have an ordinance placed before this council to have my property de-annexed from the city of Lafayette so I can become one with a parish where there is taxation with equal representation. I hope I haven't offended anyone. I'm just trying to bring you information that can provide us a future for the city, excuse me, for the parish of Lafayette because you are a parish elected council and president. And I appreciate you all serving that time. And I know it's difficult, but hopefully together we can get out of this and be a much better community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. And Mr. Chair, he did submit two uh, Public Record Act requests, and, but one copy, and I'll get that to you, and to legal for our handling. Thank you. Next speaker is Ray Green, and he has submitted a handout. coming, don't go away. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ray Green. I live in District 6. I'm a community activist and project armchair spokesman. It's been almost six months since I have addressed this group. I've had some serious health issues and it has prohibited me from coming down and carrying on, but I'm back in the saddle again, thank God, and I'm ready for, shall we say, a reality check. The last time I was here on the agenda, I was asked a couple of questions that I had to do some research on. The answers were found, and I again asked to be on the agenda to discuss the matter. I was flatly denied by two council people. This was rather confusing because of the reason they gave both said that they could not get enough support to justify my request. 
confusing because the previous council, all nine of them, voted to support Project Armchair, all nine. And five of you are here tonight. I don't know what in the world has happened to change your mind. So what's the problem? Five of you voted to support Project Armchair. I have to answer questions when speaking to various groups, civic clubs, senior groups, disabled veterans, expectant mothers, and short-term people with hip, knee replacements, broken legs, and so forth. They keep asking, what's the problem with the council? Why have they changed their minds? The only thing I can say is I don't have any idea because they refuse to discuss it, and it's fact, because the two people that refuse to put me back on the agenda are here tonight. This has resulted in a new theme. Armchairs are absolute perpetual necessities. Do you really think that we're going to no longer have senior citizens just this morning on one of the national network programs they were talking about how octogenarians, that's people like me who's over 80 years of age, is increasing every year. And the older we get, the more difficult we have with mobility issues. You know 20 to 25 percent of the population are seniors in the United States and here in Lafayette. Also, one out of every five people have some type of disability, naturally some more so than others. We also have a lot of disabled veterans. And women are not going to quit having babies. That's perfectly obvious. I've spoken to several ladies' groups, and 85% of the women say that they have had difficulty in getting up from a chair with no arms during their seventh, eighth, or ninth month of pregnancy. One lady said, look, if you want to know how it is to be pregnant and can't get out of a chair with no arms, sit in the chair, put a 25-pound watermelon in your leg, and try to get up. So armchairs, again, are absolute perpetual necessities, people. As long as we have civilization, we're going to have a need for armchairs. And we're only asking for 5% of the seating capacity. And it's not going to cost this council one penny. It's not going to cost the government one penny. I am presently working with legislative assistants from Lake Charles to Lafayette to Washington, D.C. I've been promised a meeting with the Louisiana State Senator, State Representative, one of them that we've already gotten a law passed, stating that all future government entities must have at least 5% of the seating capacity with arms. That is now a state law, thank God. Also, two United States senators and a United States representative as soon as they return to Lafayette. They're going to ask, are you getting any resistance from anybody? And I'm sorry to say, yes, I am. The only resistance that I have gotten in speaking to hundreds of people is this group right here. And I cannot understand why. I've spoken with groups, clubs, private agencies, disabled veterans, and the only group, again, that seems to give me some type of resistance is the Lafayette City Parish Council. And to me, I can find no justification. I have never, and all the people that I have spoken with, I've never had one person to raise their hand and say, I can give you an objection for not having these armchairs for 5%. Not one person has done that. But we've got nine here that have done it. And it beats me why that is. I don't know. It's confusing Your time indeed. Is up, Mr. Green? Yes. Your time has expired. May I have another 30 seconds? No, sir. We don't give expanded time here. On occasion, you do, sir. No, not under my watch. So thank you very much. Was that the final speaker? I still need to be put Please. on the agenda for next time. Uh, Boone Gilbert. Hi, good evening. My name is Boone Gilbert. I own a company here in town. It's a concierge company for home buyers and renters and others moving in and out of properties here in Acadiana. You brought up an interesting topic a little while ago on Republic Services. 
and that there will suddenly be a uh, cut off of their 4,000 delinquent customers. I wanted to prepare you for some problems that you're going to experience from those customers as the whole time has dramatically increased over the last 60 days trying to get in touch with Republic to take care of accounts. The whole time used to be four to 10 minutes and now it exceeds 45 minutes every day. We call them multiple times throughout the day and it's always a very, very long hold time. Most of your, uh, your people around aren't going to wait 30, 40 minutes to try to get in touch with them, and they're going to start calling the government. They're going to call you as council people. They're going to call the agencies, and they're going to have a lot of problems getting their services reconnected. So I just wanted you to be prepared. If you can reach out to Republic, which I have, I've talked to their vice president of operation. They consolidated their call centers from 105 uh, throughout the U.S. to three. So you're going to experience a lot of these calls from the 4,000 people that you represent not being able to get into Republic's uh, call center. They already are exceeding way over their call limits. And if you add 4,000 more people on, it's going to be your problem. So I just wanted you to be prepared to get these calls because they are going to have to come to you because they cannot get to Republic. I can promise you that. We, we get them already. <laughs> well, you're going to get 4,000 yeah. of them now, yeah. uh, Mr. Boudreau, yeah. instead of just a few. Yeah. So, and I, I, I deal with them every day. And like I said, we call them multiple times throughout the day. And there is no good call time. Even up till they say 7 p.m., they answer their phones, but they don't. Uh, so you, you're going to get the calls, and uh, they are really going to be uh, pretty mad because their garbage is going to be out front, and they can't get it picked up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, Mr. Gilbert was the final speaker. We, do have, we did have two citizens who signed in who did not wish to speak. One who signed in support of public participation in energy, and the second individual who signed in support of clean energy. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move to reports in our discussion items. Jeremy, could you please read item number six? 2016 Comprehensive Annual Financial Report of Lafayette Consolidated Government by Burton Colder with Colder, Champagne, Slavin, and Company. Okay. Before we hear from Mr. Cold, I'm going to go to Ms. Toops um, as Finance Director. Uh, to just kind of lead us into this presentation, please. Mr. Colder is here to discuss the to discuss our audit for fiscal year ending October 31st, 2016. Um, we have a clean audit. We have a unmodified opinion, and he's going to go over some of the financial and operating results. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. Um, my name is Burton Colder. Um, my partner is uh, Brian Jobert. And we'll, I'll present some items. He'll present some of the others. And uh, as Ms. Toops just indicated, we've just completed the audit for the year ending October 31st, 2016. It is an unmodified or clean opinion, the best opinion that a CPA could provide to you relative to an audit. Um, we have no management letter comment that was required to be made, which is great. Um, there was one finding that was, that's with, within the report. It's 271 pages on the CAFR. Uh, there's only one finding, and it's an overlap of a finding that, was, that overlapped into this fiscal year. It was reported last fiscal year, but because it spilled over into this year, we had to report it again. Uh, but it's been resolved, so that's not a problem. So uh, overall, uh, a good situation, and now we're going to go over some of the results uh, with the numbers. The first item, and we gave you a handout, rather than try and flip through 271 pages of the CAFR, we gave you a separate handout, and it's, it's labeled with exhibit numbers, and so we're going to use that, and uh, I'm sure all of you have this before you. We'll start with exhibit two. And Exhibit 2 is the uh, comparison of the City General Fund and the Paris General Fund to 2015. 
uh, and of course compared to the current year 2016. As you know in the charter, it's required that this government maintain two separate general funds uh, when the government was consolidated. So the city general fund is maintained and the parish general fund is maintained. So let's start with the first two columns, which are the city general fund. And here, just making some analogies, total revenues last year with $92 million, $92 million, 19,000 to be specific. The revenues this year, $93 million. 424,000. If you look through the list of items that make up these numbers, you can see the property taxes in the city went up from 21.9 million up to 23 million uh, 100,000. So up about 1.2 million dollars over the prior year. The sales taxes that went into the general fund of the city, now this is not all of the sales taxes that are collected by the city of Lafayette, it's only 35 percent of them. And that's the mandated amount that goes into the general fund. The remaining amounts go into capital projects funds or into the debt service funds to handle the debt of the city. But the 35% uh, portion that went in last year versus this year, you can see the reduction went from 28.8 million last year to 27.8 million this year. So a reduction of approximately 1.1 million it's about 3.7% reduction in the city sales tax. Um, then you going on, you have the ILOT payment, which is about $22, $23 million. The uh, licenses and permits, um, intergovernmental revenues coming from the state, and on behalf payments for salaries. This is the um, on behalf payments for the police and fire that is paid by the state but we have to show it as a revenue, and it's also shown as an expenditure within those particular departments. Um, but anyway, the totals, and you can see all the numbers there. If anyone has any specific questions relative to any of these categories, uh, please ask, and I'll try and answer those. Hearing none, uh, the expenditures for the city, the general government expenditures very close to where they were last year was $22.1 million versus $22.5 million this year. On the public safety, which is police and fire for the city, $54 million last year versus $56.8 million for the current year. As everyone is aware, there's a mandated 2% increase for the fireman salaries. That is included in here. So of the increase from $53.9 million to $56.8 million, which is about $2.9 million, about half of it is in police and half of it is in fire. The public work spending in the city's general fund went from 36 million up to 37.4 million. And you can see the grand total of the expenditures within the general fund only of the city, 79.6 million last year versus 83.1 million for the current year. Excess of revenues at this line item was $12.4 million for the city versus 10.4 million for, the, um, for 2016. It was 12.4 million last year. Other financing sources, transfers in and out or transfers within the, uh, from the general fund to other funds of the city, transfers um, out of the general fund are going to other funds of the city. And then you have internal transfers. You can see that number is $6.5 million this year was $6.1 million last year. If you look, just slide over to the parish column, this is the allocation of the cost that is paid by the city that is reimbursed by the parish. And uh, you can see it was a positive number within the city category, and of course it's, an, it's a transfer out, internal transfer out of the parish general fund. So total other financing sources or uses, it's a net use of $5.6 million last year, a net use of $5 million for the current year on the city's general fund. The net change or net surplus for the year in the city general fund, $6.8 million, $6 million to be specific, uh, last year versus $5.3 million for the current year. Your accumulated reserves going into the current fiscal year, and of course was the ending number last year was at 39 million uh, in reserves at the city general fund level. This year it's up to 44.4 million dollars. Any questions on some of these numbers as presented? Uh, hearing none, I'll go on to the next two columns which is the Paris general fund. And here you have a little bit of a different situation. Um, revenues did go down from 13.9 million versus 12.9 million. So we're down about a million dollars. 
And if you look at the second line item up there, you can see where that million dollars is in sales taxes. The sales taxes for the parish went from 5.8 million down to 4.7. It is a reduction of 19.7% in the sales tax is collected by the parish. Uh, most of the other revenue items are very close. They're, some are up, some are down, but in total they're very close to where they were uh, last year. Now looking at the expenditures for the parish general fund, the general government expenditures, 1.2 million last year versus 1,255,000 for the current year. Pretty much the same. On the public safety was 3.1 million last year versus 3.7 million for the current year. This is uh, police and fire. Uh, mainly it's in the fire area that you had on the, uh, you have some allocations to the parish uh, fire departments and of course that's where some of this increase is, is stemming from. Uh, public works, we spent 88,000 at the parish level uh, last year versus 65,000 this year. Culture and recreation, 185,000 last year versus 135,000 this year. Under health and welfare, 161 thousand last year versus 186,000 for the current year. Economic opportunity, 50,000 last year versus 45,000 for the current year. Total expenditures for the parish general fund, 4.8 million was spent last year, 5.4 million for the current year. Um, excess of revenues over expenditures at this line item before the transfers, you were at $9 million in the general fund last year of the parish. This year we're at $7.5 million. And then from that we're going to subtract out the other financing sources and uses. I've already addressed the $6.5 million uh, for this year in internal transfers to the city uh, for overhead purposes. And the total net transfers out of the parish general fund 9.4 million last year, 9.6 million for the current year. And your change in fund balance, which is your deficiency for the year, last year was only 337,000, this year it is at $2,104,000. You can see your reserves at the parish level have dwindled. They were ended up last year at 3.8 million, subtracting out the $2.1 million deficiency for the year. You're left with only $1.7 million in the parish general fund reserves as of October 31st, 2016. So it's, it's pretty much at a uh, pretty much a critical stage here, and we'll look at that in just a minute and take a snapshot. I'm not going to go over the total columns. They're strictly just additions of the two numbers here. Um, but what I'd like to do is to flip back to Exhibit 1, which is the comparison of the snapshot or balance sheet as of October 31st, 2016 versus 15 on these two general funds. Um, and I'm not going to go through each item, but you can see all the assets that are listed being the cash investments, and that's the bulk of what both of them have in their assets. Uh, total assets of the city's general fund at October 31st, 16, 47.2 million. Uh, this year it was 41 million last year. Your, your uh, liabilities, you can see towards the middle of the page, about 2.1 million last year versus 2.8 million for the current year. And your fund balance, which we just looked at, total fund balance last year was 39 million. We're at $44 million at 1031 of 2016. Looking at the second to last line item that we've expressed down at the bottom, the approximate number of days of operating expenditures that you have available in the city's general fund. If everyone remembers, uh, generally the good, uh, kind of a benchmark, the minimum you should have is about 60 days, approximately two months of reserves. Well, you're much healthier than that in the city general fund, you're at 202 days. So you're uh, about three times or better than three times what's required, which is great. Um, now, looking at the next column, the parish general fund, uh, not so good. Uh, as we've pointed out, the Total assets went down from $4 million down to $2.7 million. And of course, towards, towards the bottom of the page or the second half of the page, the fund balance, as expressed earlier, went from $3.8 million down to $1.7 million, uh, a reduction of $2.1 million from the prior year. And look at that same line item, the second to last line item. Last year, this, the parish general fund had 80 days of available resources and reserves. We're down to 22 days at this current fiscal year. 
again, required to be 60 days at least, and the higher the better, so you're only at one-third of where you need to be. And unless the situation has changed from where it was at October 31st, it's probably more critical as we speak today than it was then. So just wanted to point that out. But I don't think I'm telling you anything that your administrative staff and, and Ms. Toops has not indicated to you in the past. Any questions here? Bert, yeah. Yes, um, sir. Actually, I thought in the past we talked about a standard of 90 days, but you're saying 60 days of 60 operation? 60 days is the minimum, uh, Mr. Boudreau, but uh, it'd be, the higher the better. Uh, right. We'd like so, to have it at least at, at 90, but 60 is what's kind of the, the, the accounting literature that, that you read that will tell you that you should be. So, so for our appreciation, when we see 22, um, and that was as of October of 2016. Yes, sir. That, that what has happened since October to May, we, we could very well be at five or six for all we know. Right. But give, give an appreciation for that in, in, in non-accounting um, terms. W w what are you telling the people who are listening the status of this government, this parish government, parish government. as it relates to these days of operation? Well, what's going to happen in, uh, is Basically, when you're going to reach a point that you have really no reserves available, is you're going to start and begin to have, and probably already are having, some cash flow issues. And you're going to have a difficult time in paying your bills. Okay, Ms. Toops, you, you, you know. I just wanted to step in. Mr. Boudreau, you are correct. It's always been Lafayette's goal to try to stay at 90 days. Accounting literature recommends 60 days, but... We have found here after Katrina and several other hurricanes and emergency events that in South Louisiana, we need a little bit more money available in our general fund. Um, I was in the New Orleans area after Katrina and there were parishes that were completely shut down for over six weeks. So they had no sales taxes, no property taxes, no revenue coming in and they had to use the money in their general fund, what they had available for those events. So that is really the main reason why we strive for the 90-day level. Do, do you have an idea at this time, this report is as of October 2016, and these are the numbers as of then. Do you have an idea of how those numbers have been impacted since then, by any chance? Uh, it, it's going down. I'm expecting a similar result for the current fiscal year based on what we adopted in the budget. Uh, we ended the year a little bit better 